Welcome back to uh, Imperial College Healthcare NHS Trust. Uh, I've got Luke Howard with me who uh, leads our pulmonary hypertension service. We are uh, uh, one of the national sort of uh, specialist centres for pulmonary hypertension. Now that group of patients is vulnerable, Luke, and uh, how are you managing that population? Well, what we did very early on um, was to switch all of our um, uh, outpatient consultations uh, to telephone or video. So we did that at the beginning of March uh, and we've been running a full outpatient service ever since then. In fact, our DNA rates, the rates of attendance uh, of non-attendance have gone right down almost to zero. Uh, so that is, we're keeping that going uh, and we're continuing to supply patients with specialist drugs. Um, what we've had to do, uh, and we've now agreed this nationally with all the other uh, national centres, is effectively uh, massively lower the bar in terms of diagnostic workups. So before, where we would have had VQ scans, CTs, MRIs, right heart catheters, exercise tests, and so on, before contemplating specialist drugs, we're now saying uh, if the clinical history fits the bill and an echocardiogram shows pre-capillary pulmonary hypertension, we're now offering um, uh, standard uh, oral drug therapies uh, and we will have to undertake right heart catheterization at a later date. So we're, we're lowering the bar in order to make sure that people who have pulmonary hypertension are not disadvantaged, but we're seeing a massive drop off in the referrals. Um, uh, so we're doing all that we can. Trying to have clean sites where we can do echocardiograms is very important. Trying to use all the imaging that's been done locally, sourcing that and bringing it over for us to review here, all of these uh, sorts of things. Uh, we're transmitting information to patients through our nurse specialists, also through the Patients Association, which is very active online, and most of our patients are members of this. Uh, we also um, have informed all of our patients that they should be shielding, although they weren't initially formally categorised as in the extremely vulnerable group by the NHS England. They fell under a bracket of respiratory conditions, but now NHS England have adopted formally pulmonary hypertension as a extremely vulnerable population so they've all been written to they've signed up uh, on the NHS uh, England website to make sure that they will get the special deliveries and so on uh, and we've submitted our data to NHS digital so GPs uh, and NHS England know who our patients are uh, and can put the appropriate strategies in place uh, to look after them so there's a whole lot of things that we've done we got ourselves organized super early uh, and uh, in many ways thoroughly enjoyed that new approach to video consultation. Many of our patients have to come hundreds of miles to see us. One of the last thing that we've done um, uh, is start to use technology more. So I've been asking people to do six minute walks on the Strava app using GPS tracking technology. What's fascinating is they do it and, and they send us the results and they're very similar to their uh, inpatient six minute walks. Uh, and in patients that we're concerned about, we've been sending blood bottles to them with our own barcoded labels. They've been having their bloods done by their GP. It's putting them in the post to us. And we've been getting the BNP results, for example, back mm. and we're able to monitor patients remotely that way. So a lot of things going on. We had to do things uh, super quickly, but um, it seems to be working very well. So uh, always we should gain some learning out of a crisis. Uh, do you feel you're ever going to go back to a lot of face-to-face -face consultation? Well, what's the advantage of having a face-to-face -face, uh, physical conversation rather than a video consultation? It's a very good point uh, and I think we will learn a huge amount from this. Given that many of our patients have to travel hundreds of miles to see us, I think we will be able to use this experience to do a lot more remotely with the remote blood uh, bottle uh, capacity and the testing. Um, possibly we'll start to validate some of the walking tools and, and use other things just like standard activity tracking. We'll be able to separate these things out. Uh, there is always value in seeing a patient. You have a bit more time just to um and ah a little bit uh, and it, call people back into the room and that sort of thing. There may be things that we miss using this strategy, um, but I'm sure we can adopt a flexible approach such that uh, you know we we can learn and, and we can we can use this. I think in many ways to see people as and when they need, rather than just or well, see you in three months. You know, what one analogy I've got is that I actually I've never 
Preston microphone and said, Mrs. Smith, come to the room because I actually want to see them walk into the room. It's part of the assessment. Yep. I suppose you miss that if you're in front of a screen that they're also sitting in front of. So maybe that's part of the interaction that we need to somehow figure out electronically. Yeah, we, we, we do. And that would be great if we could if we could manage that. OK, great. The final question from the Pulmonary Hypertension Group is you've got a lot of people on intravenous medication. And how are you managing that intravenous medication uh, in this crisis? This is a big worry for us. Firstly, uh, new patients going on to intravenous medication are going to really have to really, really need it. Uh, it's not going to be one of those things where we think you're in a relatively severe uh, group and it will be good to start you on intravenous medication to get money in the bank. We'll still use it where we absolutely need to. But the patients who are already on it, this is a worry for us because they've got indwelling lines. If they get a fever mm. with an indwelling line, is it COVID or is it line sepsis? So we've written to all of our patients who've got intravenous lines. We've given them a clear protocol to follow that if they develop a fever uh, and they have redness around the line or they don't have redness or they have rigors or they have features of COVID to try to very quickly get people into fever related to COVID or fever related to lines, getting into an emergency department or to GPs to have blood cultures, giving them empiric antibiotics to try to rescue the line, to do anything we can to avoid them coming into hospital um, uh, to have a line change. So this is a, a major concern for us. We've got about 40 people on intravenous therapies. Um, so we've given them very clear instructions uh, about what to do and who to contact out of hours. Great. And then I suppose the final thing about that is that they, so their line is working fine. How do they actually get the drug? So all of our drugs are delivered by home delivery companies. Uh, and uh, tablet medication is delivered in a three monthly batch. But the intravenous medication is delivered on a monthly basis because there's also a lot of consumables that you need to deliver. So um, uh, it all comes via home delivery. Normally, we have to get individuals to sign for it. Um, some of this stuff is hugely expensive, uh, but we now have an agreement that uh, that it can be left on the path or in a porch uh, and patients will take delivery. One of our concerns is that some of these drugs are being used much more now on intensive care because of the COVID-related pulmonary vascular pathology we're seeing. So we've got some concerns that some of these medications may come into short supply. Mm. Um, so we're in discussion with the manufacturers to make sure that pulmonary hypertension patients are ring fenced to some extent. So, uh, Luke, thanks very much. You're clearly, pulmonary hypertension seems to be ahead of the curve. We've got a larger population of heart failure patients, coronary patients, other patients that are at risk, where I think the plans aren't as well. So, well done. Thank you.